Hi, I'm Drex. The flow arts are a fun pastime that allow people to be creative while connecting with other people that have the same passion. But do they have any additional benefits to the people that practice them? Today, we're going to talk about the health effects of the flow arts, good and bad, and what that means for the people who practice them. When I first started up poise spinning, a big part of the reason was that it was a type of exercise that allowed me to be creative while giving my body a good workout. It helped me develop my upper body strength, and the focus necessary to practice would clear my head even on the most difficult of days. A friend once lent me her Fitbit for a weekend while we were at a fire festival, and we were both surprised to find that on average, I was burning around 3,000 calories per day at the event. I've known a lot of friends who've reported positive side effects from the flow arts for maladies ranging from depression, anxiety, drug addiction, and many more. I've also taught poise spinning as a therapy for post-traumatic stress, MS, as well as injury rehabilitation. All that said, I've known lots of people who've been injured while spinning. Poi and other twin prop enthusiasts are at risk for developing a myriad of shoulder syndromes, such as rotator cuff tendonitis, subacromial bursitis, and subacromial impingement. Basically, the shoulder blade has to be stable for anything that involves moving the arm around a lot, because it anchors the shoulder joint, and if it's not, the muscles around it risk injury. For hoopers and contact staff spinners, the problems are more likely to be in developing flexibility without hypermobility. Frequently, hoopers and contact staff spinners contort their backs into a variety of extreme positions without first developing the muscles to support this kind of flexibility. With hoops, this tends to be a problem with the lower back, but for contact staff, it's more of a problem in the neck and the upper back. In addition, staff spinners who use a lot of neck traps risk tightening their scapular elevators. This can lead to weakness in the upper extremity or impinge painfully on the spinal nerves. Because of this, staff spinners should really work to balance out their scapular muscles by strengthening their lower scapular muscles as well as their thoracic extensors. But what are the proven benefits of flow arts? I'd like to give you as accurate a picture of this as I can, but it's going to have to include a couple caveats, as well as a little bit of background on how scientific research into health is conducted. You can think of there essentially being a pyramid of credibility when it comes to evidence supporting a given conclusion. At the bottom of the pyramid are anecdotal cases, hunches, or secondhand information, isolated stories or ideas that don't overall add up to a complete picture, but might make you interested in exploring the conclusion they suggest further. Next up the pyramid, we have studies and experiments, where researchers test out a hunch by assembling either a group of people to report data related to that hunch, or ask them to try out some form of intervention to see if it has any effect on them. These tend to start off with small groups of people and work their way up to large ones. It's important to note that finding a result in a small group of people can be promising, but it isn't a rock-solid conclusion. You could have accidentally selected a small group of people with some rare trait in common, or there might be a bias on the part of the researcher that influenced the result. Please note, there are lots of different types of studies that have varying degrees of credibility, but to keep things brief and easier to understand, I'm just looping them all together here. Next, we have a randomized controlled trial. This is where researchers put together a group of people and randomly assign those people to two or more groups that include at least one intervention group and one control group that does not receive the intervention. This allows us to double check and see if the benefits we saw from a study of a small group of people are actually related to the intervention or if they're just a side effect of the testing environment. When it comes to science, being able to prove that your intervention is more effective than nothing is critical. Finally, at the top of the pyramid, we have meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are reviews of multiple studies on a given topic that may or may not include randomized controlled trials. These are essentially reviews of large swaths of research. Did lots of people studying the same topic find the same results? Did two different studies reach two different conclusions? Combining the results of multiple studies widens the overall sample size and thus are less likely to have problems with biases in selection or on the part of the researchers, plus which they allow the reviewers to spot problems in a given study's methods. If a conclusion is supported by a meta-analysis, it means there's a lot of evidence to support it. When it comes to flow arts, there hasn't been terribly much research done, so I've gone ahead and looked at some of the research for pursuits that are reasonably close to what we do, such as dance, yoga, and martial arts. Take these results with a grain of salt. Just because these hobbies may seem similar doesn't mean that they're a perfect match. And now, in the words of one of my favorite YouTube channels, to the research! Quite a lot of the research on dance has been done on older people, seeing if it has any health benefits to the elderly. One 2010 study found that dancers, on average, had higher cognitive performance, shorter reaction times, and improved motor function to non-dancers. The interesting thing about this study was that it revealed that dancers didn't perform better on these tasks than individual non-dancers, but that the dancer group lacked individual poor performers. Basically, the divide between poor and high-performing dancers was much narrower and much higher than non-dancers. A 2013 follow-up randomized control trial tested two groups of elderly participants, none of whom had had much physical exercise in the past five years, and gave them about an hour's worth of dance instruction a week, and the other, nothing. 
After six months, the group given dance instruction showed an improvement of 15% in tactile skills, a 24% decrease in reaction time, and a 10% increase in cognitive skills. Not bad. A 2013 meta-analysis found good evidence to support the conclusion that dance confers a whole host of cognitive and physical benefits that includes, but isn't limited to, improvements in balance, posture, and reaction time. What about martial arts? A 2013 study on 25 older adults with moderate peripheral neuropathy found good evidence that regular Tai Chi practice improved balance, flexibility, and muscular and skeletal strength, as well as reduced the participants' fear of falling. That's a big deal for elderly people who lose mobility when they become afraid to move around. When it comes to yoga, a 2002 study found that daily one-hour yoga sessions done for three months could lower blood pressure and reduce many other cardiovascular risk factors. A 2005 meta-analysis concluded that yoga might have a beneficial impact to people suffering from depression and suggested that further study in the area was warranted. So is there actually any scientific research about the flow arts out there? Yes! but not much. A 2007 study commissioned by the American Council on Exercise found that hooping was an effective form of exercise about on par with cardio kickboxing or step aerobics. On average, they found that hoopers burn 7 calories a minute, reach an average heart rate of 151 beats per minute, and consume 20 liters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, making hooping an excellent aerobic exercise. A 2009 study scanned the brains of subjects taught a basic three-ball cascade juggling pattern. The study found the first evidence ever that training a difficult physical skill could actually alter the structure of white matter in a healthy adult brain. There was a follow-up 2014 randomized control trial that, without a doubt, is one of the most interesting pieces of research I read while putting this video together. The researchers took 40 adults and split them randomly into three groups, one control group and two juggling groups. The first juggling group was asked to practice for 15 minutes a day and the second for 30 minutes a day. They scanned the brains of all three groups, both at the beginning of the study as well as at the end of a 29-day training period. They found that people who started off with a higher volume of gray matter in the occipital parietal lobe of the brain, that's the one that governs visual-spatial reasoning, tended to have a steeper learning curve, that is, they learned how to juggle faster. At the end of the training period, the jugglers showed greater gains in their volume of gray matter and the connections in the corpus callosum. This is the structure that communicates between the two sides of the brain. Now, people who practiced for longer periods saw a commensurate gain in the volume of their gray matter but not in the skills that they acquired during the training period. The test found no difference in the skills acquired by people, whether they practiced for 15 minutes or 30 minutes per day. The important part was that their practice was daily, not how long it was for. There's also currently a study being conducted in New Zealand by Kate Regal Van West, the woman who invented the Orbitar. She's comparing the health effects of poi spinning to Tai Chi. As of this writing, her full results and data have not been published, but I think that would make a great subject for a follow-up. Don't you? Flow arts are fun, transformative, and they're probably good for you. Do them smart and in moderation, and they could have health benefits that last you your entire lifetime. Skeptical about one or more of the studies I've cited in this video? Please, read them for yourself! A link to each study I've mentioned is in the description of this video. Part of what makes science work is peer review and rebuttal. If you find another study that contradicts what I've said, please let me know so I can post a correction. Do you believe the flow arts have had a positive effect on your health and well-being? Do you use them as a form of therapy? What for? Let me know down in the comments what kind of positive effects the flow arts have had on your health. For now, thank you so much for watching, and enjoy the flow. Peace. Hey gang, so this is another one of those videos that just took an extraordinary amount of research to realize, but it was an extraordinarily fun time reading all of it. You would not believe how many cool studies there are out on a variety of different pursuits that are pretty similar to the flow arts. Um, and again, the thing that is allowing me to do that research and make these videos is the support of uh, all of my wonderful subscribers on Patreon. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi and sign up to support me for as little as a dollar a month and help me make these videos possible because it's really really, really, really important both to me and I assume to the thousands of people out there that are watching on the other side of, uh, of the YouTube and internet connection out there. Uh, if you are already one of my supporters on Patreon, thank you so much for your support. It is making all of this wonderful stuff possible.